Jay-Z, Kanye West. African Americans in Paris, right? So I'm making that. Yeah. You know? And so one of the ways I was listening to that is as a as, as a former athlete, we would get hyped, get ready for our games, right? So one of the things that I'm looking for folks to do is to really get hyped about trying to change this education system. Okay? So I wish when I walked up and was playing that African Americans in Paris, I already know that's not what it's called. And so I can get hyped. But I really want y'all to really really get into this, so although the room isn't filled, I appreciate y'all being here, because I know y'all are the folks who we got to start with that'll push this agenda forward. Um, I'm a note-taker I'm a, a note, I, a note -taker idealist, I don't know if that's a word, but I like to just think about the topic. So me and Andrew had a couple of conversations, and one day I was just in my office and I started to write. And so I'm gonna read something really quickly of what I wrote. <clears throat> First generation, low income at risk. The reality of this is some people get pissed at the fact that you're here and your brilliance gets dismissed. But not I, not me, see. I'm not ashamed to say that I got a 13 on my ACT, or I'm not ashamed to say that I got a total of 600 on my GRE, and I'm not ashamed to say that out of 28 first cousins, I'm the first one to graduate from college. But I am ashamed to say that during my undergraduate days, I felt less than. I guess I can say, I was feeling like I'm running, I was feeling like I gotta get away, get away, get away, but I don't and I won't ever stop. But I think you gotta win every day, day, something like that, right, y'all? <laughs> but every day it was something new. Whether it was financial aid having me run around in circles, sitting in a class where nobody looked like me, or having this lonely feeling inside because I couldn't call my family because nobody could tell me how college was. But then I thought about it. First generation, huh? People usually celebrate when somebody does something first, right? I mean, we celebrate when people have their first baby, and we celebrate when we get our first job, and we even got the opportunity to celebrate the fact that we elected our first black president, right? And so I look at it like this. First generation, low income, at risk. The reality of this is your brilliance and your ways of thinking will change the game. Cycles will be broken. Doors will be open. And the state of our future is up to you. So what I want you to do is stand up and just clap it up for the folks who's in the room. Please do that. Simple as that. Education inequalities have been around for so long. Back in the day, there was many people who would be killed if they were trying to get their education or learn how to read. And we're not that far away from schools being integrated. I don't know if you all know who Inez Prosser. Inez Prosser was one of the first black women psychologists. And she was against the integration of schools. And so when I heard that, I said, oh, man, I wonder why. And so she said she felt that the students of color back, back then who were black, <coughs> she didn't feel as though they would get the same quality education if the schools were integrated. She might have been a psychic. So I was reading this article from the mid-90s. And it was talking about the demographics of the school system in terms of the students within the classroom, but also the teachers. And what it was saying was, the students were starting to look a lot different. It was about, it was turning, it was, it was turning, it was, it was real diverse, right? But for some reason, 
the demographics of the teacher will stay in the same. Interesting. So I'll give you a fact, or a stat, however you want to put it. Over 80% of the teachers in the K-12 school system are white females. But the demographics of the students within these classrooms are changing. Interesting, huh? And that was an article in the 90s. It's 2011. You need to wake up. If a teacher is not culturally competent, or, know, or she doesn't know, or he doesn't know, or the, whoever the teacher is doesn't know anything about the students that are sitting in that classroom, I would consider them unqualified. Because unfortunately, it's really hurting our students. Now, I don't play the blame game at all. You know, a lot of people out here are saying, well, it's the teacher's fault, it's the student's fault, it's the parent's fault, it's the school's fault. I don't play the blame game, because we're all in this, we're, we're in this fight together, right? But I will say, you got folks out here that's throwing those one hit of punches like Mike Tyson and other folks throwing punches that can't hurt the fly. So we need to step our game up. And it's not always easy for students to make that transition into higher education. I was reading this book by Jawanja Kanjufu called uh, Black Student Middle Class Teachers. Real simple reading, but it was interesting because two quotes stood out to me. And the first quote was, school is the first place where students learn to fail. And the second one was, one of the best ways to evaluate school is by the conversations in the teacher's language. Has education got away from putting students first? Because when you're a student, you don't look at things the same. When I started to work in the K-12 school system, I started to see things a little bit different. I would hear things like, oh, that student is terrible. Or, that student would never make or stuff like, oh, that student is an idiot. Their family, they've been some idiots for a long time. I even got the opportunity to watch a video of one of my students being choked by one of his teachers and dragged across the hallway. What happened to the teacher? He was there three, four days later, and this teacher happened to be the president of the teacher's association within the school. 